again, you've joined us for Asking and Answered. It's a really a special day. It's Friday, but it's a day that we get partnered up with one of the great minds from Fundraising Academy that's based at National University. You can send in, you can call, you can tweet. I mean, you can do all sorts of things to get your questions answered um, with this conversational approach. Every week, questions are different. Sometimes we see the same questions, frankly, coming in, you know, over time, maybe voiced a little differently. Um, but today we have Tony Bell, and again, really one of the great minds that, that works with the university and also works with other programming. And so um, it's really a joy to be able to get him and, and have him be here. So, Tony, are you ready, my friend, for being I in the I am episode? ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Yes, let's do it. Awesome, awesome. Well, I need to like get myself um, situated here because obviously I'm like a little off kilter because I've been chit chatting with you. So... No, it's all good. Well, you know, it's it's fry yay and <laughs> and a right. toast to the weekend. Oh, we can't. There's my my mug. So a toast to uh, to Friday and the weekend. And, I love it. And well, I'm sure again... we're going to celebrate sponsors. There we go. So, there we go. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. I think you could run the show. Um, <clears throat> again, Tony's got me all choked up. Um, Tony, we have amazing partners. Absolutely. Fundraising Academy at, New at National University is one of them. But we also have Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. And they're with us literally day in and day out. And they don't ask us to cover anything or not cover anything. They give us total editorial license, which is remarkable. So we are grateful for that. And we know how powerful these um, commitments are that, that these organizations have, have made with us. Again, more than 900 ap uh, episodes, which has actually turned my hair white, Tony. <laughs> so you can download the app. You can find us on streaming platforms as well as podcast platforms. And we will be with you um, wherever you are whenever you need us. So um, it's really an opportunity for us to connect with you and, and help you solve the problems that you have. Okay, this is an interesting question because this came to us from an actual board uh -huh. in Palo Alto. And the question is this, are CEOs retiring and we have not yet replaced them? Our question is this, should we hire a professional interim CEO or have a board member step in for a period of time. It's a very common uh, situation. Oh, and we just have to get someone from the board. Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. And, and I have to just kind of get the vision out of my head first of, of a board member making a motion to send a question into the <laughs> nonprofit show and then a board member seconding the motion and then the, the 40 minutes it took them to come to consensus on the question that they would submit. So I just had to kind of get oh. that vision out, out of my head. But I, I love that the question is collective. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, this wouldn't have even been a question because the consideration of an interim CEO would have not even been part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I love that they're thinking that way. My recommendation is to lean into if your budget allows, uh, which I would assume, you know, if you budgeted for the CEO and there's a period of time they're not there, there's still the salary that was budgeted, yeah. uh, that you could probably invest in an interim CEO. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I totally support investing in an interim CEO. I think you get a lot of, you know, a lot of knowledge along with that individual and you get a fresh perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. even during that short period of time. Uh, but I also would say that make sure you're very mindful around the expectations of the interim CEO, that okay. they understand their level of empowerment during the time that they're serving. Mm -hmm. uh, I've served in a lot of interim capacities uh, within my current organization and, and externally, you know, historically. Mm -hmm. And so it's always been important for me to really understand you know, what the expectation is and the level of empowerment. Mm -hmm. My approach with interim roles is to keep the train moving forward <laughs> and, and not to try and change the tracks that it's running on okay. uh, or, or to, you know, change it from, from, you know, 
diesel to coal or whatever that might right. be. It, it, yeah. it really, and my, my take on serving interim roles has always been keep the train moving and keep it on its tracks. Because if you make too many changes in an interim, you're setting up the current staff and potentially the organization for too much change as the permanent CEO comes in and kind of wants to paint their picture. Mm -hmm. So uh, so yes, interim CEO all the way, just be really clear about the expectation and the level of empowerment. And I would caution the amount of change you would want that interim CEO to make knowing that a permanent leader is going to come in and they will see things through their lens. So let me add another question onto this. And that is, you know, we keep talking about this dearth of talent because we have an aging leadership, you know, demographic. Um, we have a lot of people that um, are a little hogtied to the to the, the nonprofit sector because of finances. And maybe they're like, wow, because there's the more opportunities to get, you know, higher wages in the for-profit sector. Having said that, how long should we, we realistically think that we're going to need an interim director? That's a, a really good question. And it has a lot to do with the level of, you know, depending on the CEO, right? What is, what is the, the area in which they're serving. So there's a certain level of expertise that may exist with, you know, within that in terms of what the job description looks like and, mm -hmm. and the skills and expertise of, of the candidate. Uh, I would say a minimum six months. You okay. may, yes, I would say a minimum six okay. month interim CEO. Uh, okay. When you think about, again, just the, the, the recruiting process, you know, mm -hmm. your, your uh, yes. Just the recruiting, the interviewing, uh, if they're with the current employer, you want to make sure that they can give them the appropriate amount of notice. Uh, right. I, I would I would say six months at a minimum. Okay. Well, that's good to know, because, you know, when when I first read this question, I thought to myself. This board has no idea how hard it would be to take a volunteer position you know, just step in and say, oh, yeah, we can hold things together because it's not that simple. And an interim is, you know, traditionally um, educated. They they have a process, you know, they can, te I love what you said, keep the train on the tracks. Mm -hmm, true. So very interesting. Very interesting. Well, that was good. Are you ready for the next one? I am. <laughs> I don't know. You did so well. There's a lot of pressure. I here. felt like I talked too much, but yeah, let's go for it. No, that's it was, it's fascinating. And I got to say, Tony, I think a lot of organizations right now in America are, are looking at the same, same yeah. situation. Yeah, I, I think I, so too. Yeah, I really do. Okay, Charlie from San Antonio, Texas writes, we run a human services shelter and are considering having volunteers sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement form, before they start their service. Do you think this will keep volunteers away? Interesting question. Never it, had this asked before. It, it is an interesting question. So, uh, there, so there are a lot of things that initially come to mind with with this particular question, and and one of those is why now? So, what is the <laughs> why? What is the why around yeah. implementing the NDA at this moment in time? Maybe there's something that's changed in their programming that now requires them to. Maybe they're offering volunteer um, opportunities that have closer connectivity to the clients that they serve. So my the first thing is to really ask yourself, why why are we doing this now? Uh, and I'm making an assumption, right? They said we're considering. So right. historically, they've not done this. So why now? Mm -hmm. um, that's, I well, think, what, that's interesting. You know, I and I think that volunteers... Uh, that are passionate about a mission and want to contribute in that capacity aren't going to have a problem signing an NDA. Yeah. Again, as long as there's a good understanding of the why. Right. Uh, and think about ways that you can make this really easy for the volunteer. So most organizations have a volunteer application. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, by signing this application, you agree to the non-disclosure agreement of, you know, versus having them sign five different, you know, documents. So I think there are ways to uh, 
uh, integrate this logistically where it's not a burden uh, to your volunteer application or your volunteer onboarding. Um, and I definitely support anything that might minimize liability for the organization. So, mm -hmm. you know, if this all started through the lens of how are we going to minimize liability, uh, I really, you know, appreciate and celebrate that they're having that conversation also. Yeah. You know, I remember um, signing uh, an NDA privacy agreement probably like, oh my gosh, close to 30 years ago mm -hmm. and um, for a, a domestic violence uh, campus. And I was like, well, why, why do you do this? And they're like, well, we keep our address you know, private sure. and mm -hmm. silent because abusers will come and try and kill their, you know, their mm -hmm. yes. the women and children. And I was like, what? I mean, so, you know, it, it ended up being a, a teaching moment for me because I had no idea. I mm -hmm. really didn't, I didn't know. And it was the beginning of my journey for, le you know, learning. Sure. But I think to your point, you can use it as a, as a, an onboarding situation you know as possible if possible and i think there's a reality of you know risk so if you're you know dealing with a hipaa issue which is medical mm -hmm. or you're dealing with children or minors mm -hmm. you you have these compliance things that mm -hmm. you must abide by so i think it's Agreed. a you know yeah and i really appreciate what you said why now that's a that's a heavy that's a heavy question <laughs> You know, so yeah, that's smart. Okay, well, let's go to name withheld in uh -oh, Chicago. Oh, I know you love those. <laughs> These are my favorites, my favorites. Okay, I had a call from a large donor recently who asked me about another nonprofit they're thinking about donating to. While I was honored that they can, um, that they think I can offer some perspective, I think this might be a conflict of interest. How should I handle this? We've gotten this type of a question before. Um, and it has to do with like professionalism and, and knowing the sector. And yet I think in, at the heart of it, we're like, we don't want to lose a donor to somebody else that we compete with or, you know, so this question to me has a lot going on and I don't know, what do you think about this? Yeah. So the first thing that I, I would tell name withheld is take the flowers and celebrate, like you're saying, the fact that this, <laughs> this donor, you know, trusts you yeah. to ask you, th this says a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot okay. <laughs> about the relationship that this individual has with this, I'll say major donor, uh, as opposed mm -hmm. to large donor, but, the, you know, with this major donor. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you have an opportunity, one, to, you know, celebrate that, right? Take a moment and say, wow, they trust me enough. Yeah. Uh, and then I think you have an opportunity to uh, take that trust even deeper with the donor uh, by having having the conversation with them. And, and the way that I would approach the conversation is, uh, I think it's wonderful that you want to expand your philanthropic footprint. You're not moving your footprint, <laughs> but you're expanding your your footprint great work. and 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 i would and and i would encourage you or, or maybe you would say you know think about what are the things that make you feel really good about contributing to my organization okay. when you donate to my organization how does that make you feel and and how fulfilled are you in that and look for the same qualities that you like about our organization in this organization. Wow. So that that's I love that. That's off the top of my head. I think that's how I would kind of frame that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't walk away from the opportunity to deepen their trust in you. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 folks that are truly committed to the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and truly committed to elevating the sector. Yeah. We're not going to prevent donors from moving to other places as right. long as they're still contributing. Right. We would, I, I would never be afraid of losing a donor if they asked me that question mm -hmm. because I would celebrate the fact that they want to expand their philanthropic footprint and I would ask them to think about all of the ways in which 
they benefit or feel good about their contributions to us? And does that organization mirror that experience? I love that attitude because I didn't, I didn't come to it this way in, mm -hmm. in your direction. Um, I think my, I was fearful, you know, uh, I'm like, Oh my God, you know, name with hell's going to lose. <laughs> you know? And that's the scarcity mentality. I hate that about myself. I, I know that that exists. Um, but I really love what you had to say about, you know, philanthropic leadership and trust. Um, because we've been talking about that a lot, Tony, just in the general sense that we need to move our funders to this sense of philanthropic trust. Mm -hmm. We're going to let you organization invest this, this donation mm -hmm. because you know best mm -hmm. and we trust you. And so we need to have those conversations, you know, all along. So that's cool. I, I like the way that you said that. And I love take the flowers. <laughs> Do the wave. <laughs> Take the flowers. And I mean, really, it, it, it says it, that question said a lot to me around, again, the I said it a lot around the level of trust that that mm -hmm. donor has, that they want that kind of advice about mm -hmm. how to invest more philanthropic dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got to believe, too, that it would help um, that person inform themselves and their team about like what went on. Like, sure. what was the donor asking? What were they thinking? Like, you know, it, it gives you almost an insight that maybe you wouldn't have. Yeah, very um, true. Very interesting. Okay, well, let, that was that was a really, really interesting It was a question. good question. Yeah, really fascinating. Um, okay, this next question comes to us from, I, know, I don't know if this is Seen or Sean. So I don't know. Sorry. Sean, probably. You, you think it's Sean? Sean from Philadelphia, PA. What is the average size of a board of directors? It seems that we are always in a struggle to fill our board of director seats. Yep, you probably are. Also, do we need to reflect a change in our number of board seats somewhere such as bylaws or other legal documents? <laughs> I I just I must be in, I must be in a certain mood, Julia, because it's like, what is the average size of a Board of Directors, I'm like, I don't know, 5'8 and 180 pounds. I mean, <laughs> that's, but, uh, that's the average size of a that's board good. of directors. That's good. But, boom. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I mean, this is an excellent question. Mm -hmm. And I always like to, to reference awesome resources within the sector, right? So Board Source, right, is, is yeah. an incredible organization with incredible resources yeah. around board development yeah. uh you know and and they may actually have an activity that would help you identify for your organization what really is the the best size because it's going to depend on uh are you a grassroots organization so do you, do you need a board that's more hands-on yeah. and that is actively out there like even even leading the programming Right. Uh, do you need a board that's more advisory, right? You've got the staff, you've got the talent and the, and the skills. So you need a board that's going to help you with the vision, setting the direction of, of the organization and opening doors mm -hmm. for your, your yeah. fundraising team. So there are all of those variables. Uh, considering all of that, I typically say nine to 13 okay. <laughs> is, is, is what, you know, if you were to ask me, what is the average size of a board of directors? Uh, mm -hmm. Just based on my experience and the type of organizations that I have always worked with, okay. uh, it's been around nine to 13. Mm -hmm. Now, I can tell you that a local chamber of commerce here, I think there's 35 board yeah. members, right? And yeah. and so depending, you know, a lot of the, the nonprofits that are kind of economic engines for our communities, uh, they <laughs> yeah. typically have larger, you know, like 25 to 40 people on on their boards uh, more grassroots organizations that are, are serving uh, very specific populations of mm -hmm. the community typically have that nine to, to 13 mm -hmm. uh, nonprofits that are just starting they usually start with the minimum which is typically three right it, to get your articles of incorporation in most states mm -hmm. you have to have a minimum of three board members mm -hmm. so uh, and then they aspire to get to that place where they're you know at a minimum of nine. Mm -hmm. So I would say nine to 13, 
And yes, your bylaws absolutely have to reflect uh, the number of board members. And your your bylaws can can show a range. So again, your your bylaws may say that you know the the board will be populated with a you know anywhere from three to thirteen or anywhere from nine to thirteen uh, board members. For me, the biggest part of that, and and I like that you use. Uh that idea of of range because the biggest thing for me is you have to define what quorum is because mm -hmm. if you don't define voting quorum your board is actually not fiduciary a fiduciary um in fiduciary compliance right because some of those votes that they take might not actually be um able to be recorded right mm -hmm. so you have to know what the quorum is, and if you can take digital, you know, voting, if you can do voting by phone, voting by email, I mean, there, there's a whole strategy in there that mm -hmm. goes beyond just warm bodies, right? And what they're mm -hmm. going to do and how they're going to do it. You know, I feel like a lot of folks get hung up on this number that they need to have, and they don't really look at what the composition is. Oh, for sure you know because there's the other kind of underlying part of this question where it says we are always in a struggle yeah to fill our open board seats so there's there's definitely things to take a look at there and and whether it's your process for prospecting whether it's your succession planning process mm -hmm. or lack of succession planning mm -hmm. if it's the um the qualifying of board members, the onboarding of board members, the experience once they're on the board, right? There's all of those things that they uh, need to be considered right. if, if there are certain barriers to right. folks wanting to serve or or even to their success in serving. Yeah, you know, that's a deeper dive. And, and I think <laughs> you're right. That's a, that's a, a, a systemic uh, issue and, and question. Well, while we're on the board discussion, let's talk with um, another name withheld from Columbus, Ohio. And, and they write, while I know that the CEO reports to the board of directors, who does their annual review, the CEO's review? We have not done one. And as the board chair, I think I need to lead this. However, I don't feel qualified to do this. Is a CEO review done by the entire board, a committee? Help. <laughs> it's an interesting question because I've been a part of this um, and it was uh, it was an executive committee function yes. um, because it was a little more private and the way we did it was um, we're going to do the review. If you have any questions or comments, submit them to the board chair that will get reviewed and then it will be done um, with the uh, executive committee which was still like nine people. So it wasn't like, you know, we'll do it over coffee. I mean, it was kind of like, dun, 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 you know, it was stressful. Right, yeah, no, exactly. So a, a couple of things here, and, and so name withheld, the, the communication or administration of the mm -hmm. performance review should be between the board chair and the CEO, it should not be in my recommendation, in my experience, mm -hmm. it should not be a panel mm -hmm. that delivers the, uh, you know, the, the annual review. Uh, it really should be the board chair to the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my experience too, Julia, is similar to yours, where it's been the executive committee of the board that have done that. Mm -hmm. uh, but like you said, that can even be too much. Yeah. So you may want to put together a, a special, you know, work group or a special committee of, of just three people, the okay. board chair and maybe two others to work on the annual review uh, to help the process and minimize the amount of time investment in the committee. You know, definitely make sure that you're providing a, the CEO an opportunity for a self-appraisal. So okay. make sure, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's really, really, really important okay. that the CEO have an opportunity for a self-appraisal. And then the mm -hmm. that committee should review the self-appraisal and then draft the overall appraisal that or review that will be delivered uh, to the CEO. Uh, because we've 
as as the year passes, if if the chair, I mean, they would need to go back and review all of the minutes or or CEO reports to kind of remember everything that happened. Yeah. Uh, so that information that comes in, not just the CEO, but any performance review process or in, annual review process, mm -hmm. is is richer when the team member has an opportunity to submit their self review. Um, I love that because. So, I think the other part of that is that, you know, a board is not there every day. So they're not going to necessarily see everything. And so right. that's cool. That's a, that's like a, yeah, that's a huge takeaway. Well, Tony Bell, you always give me a huge takeaway with these times that we get to spend with you. I mean, you always have something amazing to say. Tony Bell, Senior Director, National University Academies Relationship Center. Um, Fundraising Academy at National University. I can't say enough about them. Their team and their trainers are just amazing. The content is free. There's just so many ways to, to engage with the content. And so check out fundraising-academy.org and then you can go into their learning portal and it's just remarkable. Um, so Tony, thank you for, for joining us and, and being such a light of wisdom in our sector. We really, really appreciate it. Well, always... thank you. Go ahead. No, I just thank you for the opportunity. I mean, I'm so honored to represent the Fundraising Academy and, and National yeah. University. And you make it easy, Julia. You bring out the best in all of us. So thank you again. Well, it's a lot of fun. It really is. And we have fun every day on the nonprofit show with our exa amazing executive partners. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy. Love that coffee mug. Your part-time controller, <laughs> nonprofit thought leader. Of course, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Tony, you know, more than 900 episodes. I've ended every show with this mantra, it means, right. and I know it's hokey, but it means something different almost every single day. Mm -hmm. And so I know you've had a rough road in the past couple months. And so I'm saying this to you directly, my friend, to stay well so you can do well. Yeah. We'll Love see it. you back here soon. Have a restful weekend. Take good care. Thanks. Bye.